From St. Paul's Baptist Church, here's the scoop. The doors of our church are open. We invite you to join us for worship each weekend at 9 a.m. at St. Paul's North, at 10 a.m. online, or at 11.30 a.m. at St. Paul South. Please review the updated reopening strategy on our website at myspbc.org or by scanning the QR code for details on attending in-person worship. To join us online, download our mobile app or join us at myspbc.tv, Facebook, YouTube, Roku TV, and Apple TV. To join us by phone, call 855-905-7023. To subscribe, please press number 1 when prompted, and you'll receive a call each week when worship and Bible study goes live. Sunday School for Imagination Children and SMB students is now open at St. Paul's North. Students can find a Sunday School group by visiting myspbc.org or by scanning the QR code on the screen. Plan now to celebrate our 113th church anniversary, Sunday, November 20th. This year's church anniversary theme, I Remember When. We have wonderful stories we can share over the years, but which ones stand out the most to you that bring you the most joy? Make a 20-second video or less sharing your best SPBC I Remember When moment. Upload video to myspbc.info slash I Remember When. We are grateful for the sacrifices that have brought us this far and the sacrifices that continue to seed our future. Give a sacrificial donation of $113 to our Legacy Fund at myspbc.info legacy. 
to support our long-term needs towards scholarships, capital improvement, and ministry. Clutter. All of us have it. Few of us want it. Fewer still know how to manage it. Clutter cramps, crowds, and at times confuses us. Clutter reveals our secrets. It's a personal made-to-order problem physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Is it possible to clear the clutter? That's the question that senior pastor Dr. Lance Watson tackles in this new message series because battling clutter is not a one and done, but a continuing process of making room for what's really important in life. We invite you to join us on this four-week journey to unclutter our lives. Series begins November 6th. Join us and 30 of our community partners for our annual RVA Community Thanksgiving Food Distribution. Save the date for Thursday, November 17th from 3.30 to 6 p.m. at the Richmond Raceway, 600 East Laburnum Avenue. Our goal is to feed 1,500 families. Please help us accomplish this goal by donating $25 cash cards. For all your questions, email outreach at myspbc.org. Fire on Fridays is back this November at the St. Paul's Baptist Church. And when I think of the goodness of Jesus, my soul shouts. Go ahead and give God glory. Give Him glory now. Don't miss Fire on Fridays at the St. Paul's Baptist Church. Go to myspbc.org for more. Thanksgiving is near, and we are here to help you with your dinner plans. If you live or plan to be in the Richmond area this Thanksgiving, please visit myspbc.info slash Thanksgiving Meals or call 804-643-6171 to place your order. We have many new food options, from full course meals to side items to enhance your Thanksgiving celebration. We also have our usual items you love, like collard greens, macaroni and cheese, and potato salad, to name a few. All orders must be placed by noon, Thursday, November 17th. On our order form, you will also see an opportunity to donate. We hope you will support our efforts as we team up with members of our care and outreach teams and the diaconate to provide hot meals to a group of seniors and people experiencing specific disabilities. Our vision of finding needs and meeting them is embedded in all we do. Please mark your calendar and plan to celebrate with us in the ordination service of seven of our ministers, Sunday, November 20th at 4 p.m. at St. Paul's North Campus. Those ministers are Jaquan Ball, Sheila Bell, Carl Blakes, Angela Swinton Crawford, Tracy McArthur, Michelle Rogers, Darlene Williamson. Thank you for your time and attention. This has been The Scoop.
Good morning, St. Paul's Baptist Church. I'd like to share a scripture with you this morning. Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 2 report this way. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. You skip down a few verses and it says this in 11 through 13. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy place. Oh, what an awesome and encouraging piece of scripture for this morning. Welcome to St. Paul's Baptist Church everywhere. My name is Reverend Lance Watson Jr., the Aspire Life Stage Pastor here at St. Paul's Baptist Church. On behalf of Pastor Watson and First Lady Rose Watson and the entire St. Paul's Baptist Church ministry, we welcome you to worship. Let us start with a word of prayer. Precious and eternal Lord, giver of all good gifts and graces, thank you for this day, our daily bread, a day which we surrender to you in worship. Your blessing is indescribable, Lord. So with, your finite with our finite language and limited understanding of your vastness, we thank you for the soul that you've created in each one of us for how you've adorned it with perfect uniqueness. You've blessed it and sanctified it in perishable dust. We thank you for the bodies that you have given us, for the strength and vigor that you have preserved, for the senses to enjoy the delights of your beautiful world, for we can smell and taste and touch and see and feel, for in life we have a full table and overflowing cup to at least be able to still serve you. We thank you for the heart that feels sorrow, for the grieving spirit which longs for those in need, for the mind to care for our neighbors, for the opportunities to spread joy and happiness around, and the expectation to leaning into your wonderful glory and loving embrace. We ask this morning, Lord, that you would be present with us in worship in our homes, through our separate devices online, and even with those who are not connected with us now. Let your words speak afresh in the moments that we share. Bless our pastor and first lady. Bless our leaders and those who serve. Bless your people from your abundance. Let our praise be a blessing and pleasing in your sight. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Again, I greet you in grace and I welcome you in peace, St. Paul's Baptist Church, visitors and friends. Again, my name is Reverend Lance Watson Jr. and we're excited that you've decided to join us this morning. We are a church for people on the grow, touching the world with love, communicating the positive power of Jesus Christ to every generation and that includes you. So we thank you because out of all the places, out of all the pages that you could be attending worship this morning, you've decided to stop by and we're so glad about it. Listen, what Christ left us is community. And by virtue of this marvelous gift, we want to stay connected and get connected to you today. There are a number of ways that you can engage us. If you're new to this space, you can simply text the word NEW, N-E-W, to 804-643-4769 and let us welcome you directly. You can also connect with us using our official church app. It's downloadable in just about every mobile store, Apple phone users, Android users, and Google phone users. Simply text the word MYSPBCAPP to the phone number 833 2691388 and download it today. I love it and I'm sure that you will too. Finally, my prayer for you this morning is that God will continue to bless you in ways that you didn't see coming. I'm talking about a blindsided blessing. And by faith, it can happen and it will happen. Just believe. So in these moments that we share, I pray that you will participate fully, even if you're engaging with us virtually online. 
connect with others in the chat. Say good morning to the people above you and below you in the chat space. Leave an emoji, a hand clap of praise, or a smiley face. Put your life stage color for those of you who know who your life stage is. And then of course, worship with us. Celebrate the goodness of God on this wonderful and blessed Sunday. Again, we love to worship with you. We just can't do it for you. So praise God and get ready for worship.
Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. It is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord. And in this season of Thanksgiving that covers the entire month of November, we hope that you will pause to count your many blessings, name them one by one, and you'll be surprised at what the Lord has done. We're in a series of messages called Clutter. Everybody everywhere, say it out loud, clutter. All of us have it, few of us want it, fewer still know how to manage it. Clutter cramps, crowds, and at times confuses us. How do you clear the clutter from your life? That's our focus in this series. Last week, if you were with us, we focused on uncluttering your mind. And today, with the aid, anointing, and assistance of the Holy Spirit, we want to teach and preach about uncluttering your heart. Would you share that in the chat space with somebody? Just type, unclutter your heart. Now, travel with me to the textual territory that is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. I'd like to share just one verse of scripture from Eugene Peterson's message translation. Listen to the word of God. Keep vigilant watch over your heart. That's where life starts. Amen. I could still remember the feeling of being unhinged as we stared out of the back window of my grandmother's turquoise-colored 1967 Chevy Bel Air, leaving our childhood home at 5314 24th Street on the west side of Detroit, Michigan. We had been awakened early that morning with the news that we were moving. We had never known any house except that house, any neighborhood other than that neighborhood, any set of friends except those friends, but it made sense. All those years of parental argument, financial tension, the stress, struggle, and suffocation of laboring to provide for and raise almost a dozen kids, the smooth enough seas turned turbulent overnight when life as we knew it capsized. My parents separated, beginning a two-year absence of my father from our lives and a lengthy, stressful, question-peppered divorce process. Although I confessed Christ, I joined the Oakland Avenue Baptist Church and was baptized as a five-year-old by the Reverend Dr. William Wilson, I quickly discovered that my identity and security had not been rooted in Christ, as they told me, but had always been wrapped up in my family of origin. It was as if the lid of Pandora's box had been lifted. It wouldn't be long before addictions, which were already eating away at our mutual trust as a family, would become raging monsters we had to face and tame. My mother, who was a chronic asthmatic experience, repeated health scares and no condition to work. We were introduced for the first time to food stamps, government subsidies, church charity, and aid to dependent children. There was disorder, not just in our physical home, but in our inner home as well. For there is a living home inside each of us, whether stately and beautiful, expensive and serene, or dilapidated and in disrepair, cluttered or chaotic, it's often hard to detect your own setting for lack of vis visibility, especially amid all the external noise and distractions. It's a rare thing to encounter anybody anywhere who doesn't have what I'm going to call today heart clutter. Is your heart cluttered with the white noise of others' opinions, with the stories you tell yourself to cope, with lies you believed or agreed to, with unregulated emotions or pain that has become so paralyzing you can't proceed? Is your heart cluttered? Sometimes it's difficult to clamor through the resulting chaos because either we can't map away beyond the clutter or we are too afraid to journey into the thick of it. This internal clutter takes its toll on a soul created for wide open spaces. Heart clutter, if not addressed, can take on a, the form of fear, depression, 
anxiety, addiction, constant stress, or even physical ailments. With our physical relocation as a family, the low hum of disorder in our lives became a cluttered cacophony of stress and anxiety. I don't blame my parents' divorce. It could have been any crisis, any catastrophe, any calamity. Eventually, something would have pushed us into the same space and become the catalyst for change. I imagine as I preach today that many of you are a lot like me. You want your life to change always for the better. Is that an amen I hear? You want to grow and become the healthiest version of yourself, mind, body, and soul. You're doing your best to discover and walk in your calling and your purpose. And yet, if you are emotionally honest with yourself, you have to admit that you also have behavioral patterns, coping mechanisms, struggles, and maybe even addictions that are cluttering your life, confounding you, confusing you, and keeping you from the change you so desperately desire. You don't shy from starts. You have learned to be steadfast in purpose. You don't capitulate without resistance. You are committed to keeping it moving, even if it feels like you're trudging through sludge. But the clutter keeps cramping your crusade. Am I putting cream in anybody's coffee? How do you unclutter your heart? Proverbs 4.23 in the New International Version says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. In the message translation, which we are sharing, it reads, keep vigilant watch over your heart. That's where life starts. If you want to unclutter your life, you have to start with the heart. Encourage somebody, if you will, as you smile, just type, start with your heart. And there's a difference between our mind and our heart. The mind has to do with our thoughts. The heart has to do with our feelings. The mind centers our capacity to think logically and rationally. The heart is associated with our capacity to detect, discern, discover, and deploy emotion. And it's important for us to make this distinction because when scripture uses the word heart, it has multiple meanings. The Hebrew word labab and the Greek derivative cardia occur over 1,000 times in scripture and point to a person's capacity for physical, emotional, moral, and intellectual activities. That's the intended meaning of Proverbs 23, 7 when he says, as a person thinks in his or her heart, so are they. It is the anticipated jest of 1 Samuel 16, 7, when the prophet Samuel says, only people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It is what the writer of Proverbs meant in Proverbs 25, 3, when he said, the Lord searches all hearts to reward each according to their conduct. It's what the prophet Jeremiah was trying to describe when he said the heart is deceitful above all things. And then in Jeremiah 17, 9, that he said, it is why the spirit of God must give to humans new hearts. It's why David prayed in Psalm 51, 10, creating me a clean heart and renew within me a right spirit. It's what Jesus referred to in Matthew 12, 33, when he said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's what Paul listed as a requirement when he wrote to the church at Rome in Romans 10, 9, that we must believe in our heart and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus in order to be saved. Your heart is the center of you. It is the real you. And God knows our hearts, its joys and its sorrows, its ragings and its peace, its troubles and its rejoicing, its loves and its hatred, its doubts and its fears, its faith and its confidence. If you want to unclutter your life, you have to start with your heart because it is out of your heart that the rest of your life Lows. In Proverbs 15, 13, the Bible says, a happy heart makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. Then in Proverbs 17, 22, it says, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit 
dries up the bones. The heart wishes and desires. The heart remembers, reflects, and meditates. More specifically, as the eyes were meant to see and the ears were meant to hear, the heart was meant to understand, discern, and give insight. The heart plans, makes commitments, and decides. It is the inner forum where decisions are made after deliberation, where a person engages in self-talk, according to Proverbs 16, 9, where it reads, in his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. The heart can be hardened like Pharaoh's or darkened, according to Paul, or enlightened by faith. A sage father tells his young son in Proverbs 2, 2, store up thy commands within you by turning your ear to wisdom, and then you will incline your heart to understanding. This was Moses' point of reference in Deuteronomy 6.6 6, when he told the people of God, these commandments ought to be written on your heart. You ought to be conscious of them and educate your heart with them so that you will grow in favor, have a good name, and be safeguarded from evil. There's a difference between your mind and your heart. If you want to unclutter your life, you have to start with your heart. Can I drill down a little bit right there? Look at our verse again. Keep vigilant watch over your heart. That's where life starts. Now in the Hebrew language, keep is a word interchangeable with guard. It literally means to set a watchman over, not to bar or to seal or a coat and a shield of lead, but to set a watchman over. Keep vigilant watch. How? By filtering our emotions, our desires, our thoughts, and our responses through the word of God. Hear me well. God is the keeper. Amen. And what is the primary tool that God uses to keep our hearts? It is the word of God. So the task is simple. We are to keep ourselves in the word of God and God will keep our hearts. Jude 21 reads, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Psalm 1830 says, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. Psalm 119 verse 9, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Proverbs 2, 7, he holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless for he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. You are to start with your heart. This is not a guarantee against hurt, harm, injury, and pain, for not even Jesus was kept from that, but it is a warranty of protection by a savior who filters everything that comes to us through his nail-scarred hands. Don't miss that. That what gets to you must first pass through him. Keep vigilant watch over your heart. Why? What's the point, preacher? I'm glad you asked. Write this down first because your heart is extremely valuable. Everybody everywhere say valuable. We don't guard worthless things. I take my garbage to the street every Sunday night. It is picked up early Monday morning. It sits on the curb all night completely unguarded. Why? Because it's worthless. Not so with your heart, my friend. Your heart is the essence of who you are. It is your authentic self, the core of your being. It's where all of your dreams, your desires, and your passions live. It is that part of you that connects you with God and connects you with other people. Just like your physical body, if your heart, your spiritual heart, withers, the rest of your life will follow suit. This is why, perhaps, Solomon says, above all else, he doesn't say if you get around to it, or it would be nice if. No, he says, make this your top priority because your heart 
is extremely valuable. But secondly, because your heart is the source of everything you do. In the proverb that claims our attention today, the writer calls the heart the wellspring of life. In other words, it is the source of everything else in your life. Your heart overflows in the thoughts, words, and actions in countless communities across our country. There are thousands of natural springs where water flows to the surface of the earth from deep underneath the ground. It then accumulates in pools and runs off in the creeks or streams or rivers. If you plug the spring, you stop the flow of the water. If you poison the water, the flow becomes toxic. And in either situation, you threaten life downstream. Everything depends on the condition of the spring. And likewise, using that same metaphor, if your heart is unhealthy, it has an impact on everything else. It threatens your family, your friends, your ministry, your career, and indeed your legacy. It is therefore imperative that you guard it. It is the source of everything you do. And thirdly, we must guard our hearts because your heart and mine are under constant attack. When Solomon says to guard your heart, he is by implication implying that we live in a combat zone, one in which there are injuries and casualties. Many of us are oblivious to the reality of this war. We have an enemy, friends, who is bent on our depression and our destruction. He not only opposes God, but everything that is aligned with God including you and me. And that's why so many people, including people who lead, are particularly vulnerable. An article in the New York Times reported that members of the clergy in particular now suffer from obesity, hypertension, and depression at rates higher than most other people. Over the last 10 years, their use of antidepressants has risen while their life expectancy has fallen and many would change jobs if they could. I'm trying to argue that the enemy of your soul uses all kinds of weapons to attack your heart. These attacks often come in the form of some circumstance that leads to disappointment, discouragement, or even disillusionment. In these situations, we are often tempted to quit, to walk off the field and surrender. Because if your heart is unhealthy, it threatens everything else. Are you listening to me? So how do we get clear? How do we unclutter our hearts so that they flow freely with God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, God's power, and God's favor? Can I offer a few suggestions and then we'll be done? First of all, practice the discipline of reflection. Everybody everywhere, say it out loud. Say this one word, reflect. Now, can I get 71 of you to type it in the chat space, reflect? What does that mean? To reflect is to mull over. It is to think deeply about, carefully about. It is to meditate or deliberate about. And it is a discipline. Why? Because we live in a fast-paced, demanding, and raucous world that will drain the very life out of us if we let it. Do I have an amen anywhere? And that is why it is essential that we intentionally pull away, pause, and reflect. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, the Bible says, before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Don't miss this. If Jesus, our sable-skinned Savior, if Jesus, light in the darkness, if Jesus, hope for the hopeless, friend for the friendless, and strength for the weak, had the need to pause, park, pull away, and reflect, how much more important is it for us? For me, this is best done through a regular time of fellowship with God, time where I pray, read scripture, journal, and just be still in the presence of God. I know that you talk to God, but periodically you've got to be quiet enough and still enough for God to talk to you.
take time to consider and discern what's in my life that shouldn't be and what isn't in my life that should be. You have to determine what stays and what goes, what emotions, feelings, attitudes, reactions, and responses are helping me and which are hurting me. What is adding to my life and what is subtracting from my life? What is beneficial and what is a burden? What's keeping me stuck in the past and what's pushing me towards the future? You have to determine what stays and what goes, but you also have to determine who stays and who goes. Did you hear me? Because life is like a theater and not everybody deserves a front row seat in your audience. Some people need to be loved from a distance. Think of the relationships you have right now. Which ones lift and which ones lean? Which ones encourage and which ones discourage? Which ones are going uphill and which ones are going downhill? When you leave certain people, do you feel better or do you feel worse? Which ones always have drama or don't re you don't really understand? Which ones give you benefit and hope and enthusiasm? Which people can appreciate you and the gift that you are and which appreciate you and make you feel bad about yourself. Everybody can't be in your front row. Some people need to be moved to the balcony of your life because you cannot change the people that who are around you, but you can change the people you are around. Practice the discipline of reflection, but secondly, practice the discipline of rest. Because often what looks like discouragement and feels like despair is really just weariness. God has built rest into the very fabric of our physiology. We are made to shut down for a third of the daily cycle. One of the quickest ways to lose perspective is to cheat ourselves out of this God-given off switch. God created this world so that every 24 hours we start a new day and every seven days we start a new week and every four or five weeks we start a new month and every 12 months we start a new year. God could have just run all that time together in one package with no breaks and no places to start over. But God didn't choose to do that. In compassion, mercy, and grace, God made places for us to pause, places for us to rest, places for us to start over. But practicing the discipline of rest requires more than just a biologically induced pause. It requires deliberate choices, such as determining to get enough sleep each night and possibly napping during the day. I don't know how you feel, but the older I get, the more I appreciate a good nap. There ought to be some hands up in the chat space. It is the will of God concerning me in Christ Jesus in these last and evil days. Psalm 127 verse 2 says, God gives his beloved sleep. Psalm 4 8 says, in peace I will lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord. Make me to dwell in safety. My friend, you need to get some rest. Rest is the key to recreation. Did you hear what I said? Spell recreation, but it really means recreation. Recreation at its best is recreation, not just amusement or entertainment. Can I help somebody? Because there's a difference between amusement and recreation. The former leaves us more tired than we started. Have you ever taken a trip to an amusement park and came back more exhausted than you were when you left? Amusement can exhaust us, but recreation, recreation refreshes and grounds us. Recreation involves any activity that gives us the opportunity to express our creativity. For some, it might involve playing an instrument, cooking, engaging in some sport, painting, writing, or something else that enables you to totally detach from work, shift your focus to the present, and reconnect with your heart. Whatever the activity, it may not seem urgent, but it is vitally important. So practice the discipline of reflection. Practice the discipline of rest. But thirdly, practice the discipline of release. 
We were made to live in relationship with others. In fact, the very foundation of reality is relational. But relationships require that we take the time to invest in those we love and to forgive those who have hurt us. Don't run away, don't scroll away. Forgiveness is first a decision and secondly, a discipline. And it commences by first asking God to forgive you. Say it out loud, wherever you are. Forgive me, Lord. Then release every mistake, every misstep, every miscalculation, every error, every wrong, every sin you've ever committed into the hands of Almighty God. Why? First John 1 John 1.12 teaches if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Proverbs 28.13 says, whoever covers his sin is not wise, but whosoever confesses and forsakes his sin shall find mercy. Release the pain of your past into the hands of Almighty God. How do I do that, preacher? Go on and confess. Everybody say confess. For we are called to confess when we've done wrong, knowing that God is able to wipe our consciences clean. At the beginning and the end of each day, ask the Lord, is there anything between you and me? If you find anything that shouldn't be, pluck it out and rescue me. Search me, Lord, the old gospel song said, and then practice spiritual breathing. Exhale your flaws and inhale God's forgiveness because our forgiveness is not based on our merits, but on the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. First John 2, 1 says, my little children, I write to you that you sin not, but if anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Psalm 103, verse 12 says, God has taken my sins as far from me as the east is from the west. Isaiah 118 says, though your sins be as scarlet, they have been washed bright as snow. Jeremiah 50, verse 20 says, so effectively did God deal with my sins that when I sought for them, they could not be found. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For God is like tide. He gets the stains that others leave behind. God is like woolite. He makes you look brand new. God is like Ajax. He's stronger than dirt. Where's Bishop Hezekiah Walker when you need him? He wrote a song that said, won't he make you clean inside? Ask God to forgive you for what you've done, where you failed, how you've fallen, where you've fumbled, what you messed up, tore up, tore down, squandered, destroyed, mismanaged, and mishandled. Can I go a little bit further? Because it commences by asking God to forgive you. But this process of release continues with you forgiving others. The chat space is about to go silent now because Nothing clutters the heart like failing to forgive. I once saw a t-shirt that said, the last thing I want to do is hurt you, but it's still on my list. <laughs> you either have to laugh, cry, grunt, or say amen to that sentiment because we all have had, do have, or have been on somebody's list. What about you? Are you keeping a list of grudges somewhere? Is there somebody at work who hurt you? Somebody in your family who lied on you? Loved ones that you trusted that betrayed you? A friend, associate, or neighbor who spread untrue rumors about you? Those lists exist because relationships, like everything else in our world, break. You will not live or last a single decade in this life without getting hurt by or hurting other people. I should have 322 amens right there. It is one of the unfortunate and yet unavoidable universal patterns of life. We will hurt and be hurt by other people. J.K. Rowling in the tales of Beetle the Bard wrote, to hurt is as human to breathe. Hurt people hurt people.
That's why forgiveness is vital because if you never heal from what hurt you, you will bleed on people who didn't cut you. I said something right there. I'm not saying it's easy, but I am saying it's necessary. It's the only way to unclutter your heart. Sometimes we are tempted to forgive conditionally. I'll forgive you if, or I'll forgive you when. At other times, we are tempted to forgive partially. I'll forgive you, but if this ever happens again, it reminds me of these two men who had been at odds with each other for years. Old Joe was dying and wanted to straighten out things with Bill. So he sent word for him to come to the hospital. When Bill arrived, Joe told him that he didn't want to die with all these bad feelings between them. Reluctantly, Joe apologized for the things he had said and done. But when Bill started to leave, Joe said, but remember, if I get better, this don't count. Y'all get that later on. Sometimes we try to delay forgiveness. I'm going to forgive you eventually. But my friends, the longer we delay, the more we provide the enemy an opportunity to degrade our hurt in the offense, our offense into resentment, our resentment into bitterness, and our bitterness into revenge. We are to forgive. In his best-selling book, The Telling Room, Michael Paternity shares a true story he heard when visiting his father's ancestral village in Sicily. Every day he saw an old woman walking with her cane, struggling up a steep road to get to the local cemetery. At her tortoise pace, the walk from her home to the cemetery and back took about six hours out of her day. What grief could inspire such a difficult daily walk? Was she driven by sorrow over a departed child or spouse or parent? No, it turns out she was driven by bitterness. Her arch enemy was buried in that cemetery and so rain or shine, the old woman walked up the hill every day to her enemy's gravesite just to spit on it one more time. You can't miss this, that the one who hurt her was dead. She couldn't apologize, ask forgiveness, or set things right. But from the grave, the dead lady was still controlling the living one. I'm going to help somebody with this word because there are people I want to suggest who have hurt you that are no longer even alive. They are no longer here. They are no longer breathing. And yet they are still controlling your thoughts, your time, your energy, your mood, because you are still holding on to what they said to you, what they said about you, what they did to you. Can I encourage you with two words? Release them because failure to forgive does not hurt the person with whom you are angry, but it does hurt you. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. Practice the discipline of reflection. Practice the discipline of rest. Practice the discipline of release. But fourthly, practice the discipline of rejoicing. Steve Marabali in his work, Unapologetically You, wrote these words. You are not a victim. Say that with me out loud. I am not a victim. He said, no matter what you have been through, you are still here. You may have been challenged. You may have been hurt. You may have been betrayed. You may have been beaten. You may have been abused. You may have been discouraged. But nothing has been able to destroy you. Nothing has been able to defeat you. You are still here. You may have been delayed, but you are not denied. You are not a victim. You are a victor. You have a history of victory. Can anybody rejoice in that? You ought to rejoice because you are still here. Rejoice because you are still breathing. Rejoice because you are still living. Rejoice because you are still surviving. Rejoice because you are still thriving. It will unclutter your heart if you rejoice because God is with you, in you, and for you. No matter what you face or how you feel, you are not alone. God has been 
been with you every step of the way, every single day, working within you and working for you. Rejoice, because he that has begun this good work in you is able to complete it, and he will rejoice, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Rejoice, and be not weary in well-doing, for you will reap in due season if you faint not. Rejoice, because if God be for you, no one can defeat you. Rejoice, because they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, mount up on wings like eagles, run and not be weary, walk and not faint in the same place where you have been bound, God can set you free. In the same place where you had nothing but pain, God can promote you. In the same place where you were oppressed, God can impress his deliverance on your life. Rejoice because God is with you. Rejoice because God is in you. Rejoice because God is for you in crisis or in celebration. Whether you're in a box called penalty or a season called promotion because the question is never how big the problem, how high the mountain, how vicious the enemy, how brutal the storm, or how desperate the need. What mattered and what matters is that God is with you because that's what Jesus knew and that's how Jesus got the victory. Can I end this message? After they had betrayed him, after they had denied him, after they forsook him, after they arrested him, after they arraigned him, after they tried him, after they pierced him in his side, whipped him all night long, hung him high, and stretched him wide. After he died on Friday, Sunday morning, God raised him up with all power in his hands. And we can rejoice today because we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. He lives. Is there anybody who can shout about that? He lives. Let him unclutter your heart. It takes discipline. The discipline of reflection. The discipline of rest. The discipline of release. And the discipline of rejoicing. Do you believe it? You can have it right now. Let us pray. Almighty God, create in us a clean heart and renew within us the right spirit. Breathe on us now as we seek to unclutter our heart from anything that would stop the wellspring of life that it provides. For we want to be a free flowing fountain of your blessing in the world. In Jesus name, amen. I pause now to extend an invitation to you, my friend, to give God your heart. God knows how to handle your heart. God can make you over again. How do you know, preacher? He did it for me. And it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he will do for you. It's not hard to come into a relationship with God. God has been reaching out to you every single day of your life. And God is reaching out to you now through technology, through this word, to extend life and love and liberty in your direction. All you got to do is say yes. For the Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, that God has raised him from the dead, that being your belief, you shall be saved. Would you confess it with your mouth now? Would you believe it in your heart? And would you take that one step towards God and let God take 10 towards you? All you've got to do is use the information on the lower third of this screen. Either put the QR code in the photo app of your digital device and tap on it. That'll bring you to our team or text the word JOIN to 804-643-4769 and let our team respond to you. 
I would love to be your pastor from the bottom of my heart. We would love to be your church and grow with you in grace, but we need you to take a step. And I promise we will respond. This is your moment. Now is your time. Give God a chance.
God is great and greatly to be praised. The Lord is blessing you right now. The song intones, he woke me up this morning and started me on my way. The Lord is blessing me right now. Have I got any witnesses? Has the Lord been good to anybody on this stream? Just post your uplifted hand in the chat space. That's the spirit in which we prepare now to worship God through the giving of our tithe and our offering and our gifts of love. And we give not just because we are on the premises, either virtually or in person, but we give because we stand on the promises. What promise? Luke 6, 38, where Jesus said, give and it shall be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men and women pour into your bosom. For with the same measure you give it out, it shall be returned to you again. We stand on the promise. Malachi 3.10 that says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there might be meat, supply, or provision in my house and prove me, test me, says the Lord of hosts. See if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room to receive. So we thank you for your gifts in advance. We solicit your best gifts to support us in ministry because your gifts of generosity make our ministry possible. And it's easy to give at St. Paul's. Let's prepare to give right now. You can give by writing a check and dropping it in the mail. You can give by going to our website at myspbc.org and clicking the give button in the top right hand corner. Or you can give by using the photo app of your digital device, take a picture of the QR code, tap on it, it'll lead you to right where you need to go in order to give your best gift today. We thank you in advance. I'd like to pray with you, come into agreement with you that it shall be as God's word has declared. Can I pray for you now? Let's pray together. Almighty God, we acknowledge that everything we have comes from you. You are the giver of every good and perfect gift. The earth is yours, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. We look at our lives and our lives are filled with bounty. So out of our bounty today, out of the blessing you have provided, we bring our tithe, we bring our offering into your kingdom, into your church. Bless the gift and the giver that none might suffer for what they give, but that all might be richly and freely and abundantly blessed. We refuse to treat banks and bills better than we treat you. So we bring you our gifts first. We bring you our tithe first. We bring you our offering First, bless us now in accord with your word in Jesus name. And everybody who received that prayer said, I believe I receive. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's give generously to the Lord right now.
My brother, my sister, I hope that you have been blessed by this stream today. It's certainly been a blessing for us to share it with you. Can I encourage you right now to share it with somebody else first? Click that like button so that we can move this content up in the algorithm that social media companies use to determine where things appear in the feed of people in your network. Click that like button, then click the share button and share this word about uncluttering your heart. It was rich with scripture today. It needs to be pondered. You need to think about it. You need to read those scriptures. You need to make them a part of your devotional time. Sit with them before the Lord so that God can turn your heart into a free flowing fountain of life, love, and liberty. That's God's desire. Share this stream with somebody right now and then click on the link in the chat space and download the message application guide. This will make a great discussion with your family and friends around the dinner table, with your coworkers in the lunchroom and in the break room. Share it with somebody else. A blessing is always better when it's shared. And speaking of sharing, I'd like to share our final and parting benediction with you. It's given in the spirit of Ubuntu, an African tradition, and we print it on the screen, but we all say it together. Would you say it with me now? I am because we are, and we are because God is. You are not alone. Never, 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 never alone. God is with you, and so are we. Listen, we love you from the bottom of our hearts, and there ain't a thing you can do about it except pray fervently, love deeply, live authentically, and let God unclutter your heart. From St. Paul's Baptist Church, here's the scoop. The doors of our church are open. We invite you to join us for worship each weekend at 9 a.m. at St. Paul's North, at 10 a.m. online, or at 11.30 a.m. at St. Paul's South. Please review the updated reopening strategy on our website at myspbc.org or by scanning the QR code for details on attending in-person worship. To join us online, download our mobile app or join us at myspbc.tv, Facebook, YouTube, Roku TV, and Apple TV. To join us by phone, call 855-905-7023. To subscribe, please press number 1 when prompted, and you'll receive a call each week when worship and Bible study goes live. Sunday School for Imagination Children and SMB students is now open at St. Paul's North. Students can find a Sunday School group by visiting myspbc.org or by scanning the QR code on the screen. Plan now to celebrate our 113th church anniversary, Sunday, November 20th. This year's church anniversary theme, I Remember When. We have wonderful stories we can share over the years, but which ones stand out the most to you that bring you the most joy? Make a 20-second video or less sharing your best SPBC I Remember When moment. Upload video to myspbc.info slash I remember when. We are grateful for the sacrifices that have brought us this far and the sacrifices that continue to seed our future. Give a sacrificial donation of $113 to our legacy fund at myspbc.info slash legacy to support our long-term needs towards scholarships, capital improvement, and ministry. Clutter. All of us have it. Few of us want it. Fewer still know how to manage it. Clutter cramps, crowds, and at times confuses us. Clutter reveals our secrets. It's a personal made-to-order problem physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Is it possible to clear the clutter? That's the question that senior pastor Dr. Lance Watson tackles in this new message series because battling clutter is not a one and done, but a continuing process of making room for what's really important in life. We invite you to join us on this four-week journey to unclutter our lives. 
Series begins November 6th. Join us and 30 of our community partners for our annual RVA Community Thanksgiving Food Distribution. Save the date for Thursday, November 17th from 3.30 to 6 p.m. at the Richmond Raceway, 600 East Laburnum Avenue. Our goal is to feed 1,500 families. Please help us accomplish this goal by donating $25 cash cards. For all your questions, email outreach at myspbc.org. Fire on Fridays is back this November at the St. Paul's Baptist Church. When I think of the goodness of Jesus, my soul shouts. Go ahead and give God glory. Give Him glory now. Don't miss Fire on Fridays at the St. Paul's Baptist Church. Go to myspbc.org for more. Thanksgiving is near, and we are here to help you with your dinner plans. If you live or plan to be in the Richmond area this Thanksgiving, please visit myspbc.info slash Thanksgiving Meals or call 804-643-6171 to place your order. We have many new food options, from full course meals to side items to enhance your Thanksgiving celebration. We also have our usual items you love, like collard greens, macaroni and cheese, and potato salad, to name a few. All orders must be placed by noon, Thursday, November 17th. On our order form, you will also see an opportunity to donate. We hope you will support our efforts as we team up with members of our care and outreach teams and the diaconate to provide hot meals to a group of seniors and people experiencing specific disabilities. Our vision of finding needs and meeting them is embedded in all we do. Please mark your calendar and plan to celebrate with us in the ordination service of seven of our ministers, Sunday, November 20th at 4 p.m. at St. Paul's North Campus. Those ministers are Jaquan Ball, Sheila Bell, Carl Blakes, Angela Swinton Crawford, Tracy McArthur, Michelle Rogers, Darlene Williamson. Thank you for your time and attention. This has been The Scoop. Thank you for watching this service from the St. Paul's Baptist Church in Richmond, Virginia. Please look through our website, myspbc.org, to learn more about our church, about our vision, and how you can support our mission to empower people to grow into the persons that God created them to be.